so when I was in Italy, when I was in Rome as a, a seminarian, I remember walking past a restaurant and there were some Irish tourists and you could always spot the Irish tourists because they always looked very, very lost and pale. And um, so they had yeah, a tendency to kind of gawk around the place. And, and uh, so they were sitting there and uh, it was after the meal. So uh, the waiter came over and said, uh, so can I get you uh, uh, anything and, uh, else? And uh, they said, yeah, 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 we'll have a cup of tea. Right, if you have the tea, I will have the cup of tea. And then the waiter said, oh, good, yes. Um, would uh, you like it um, hot or cold? Because there's a thing called iced tea on the continent. And then, like, Jerry looks at Brighty and goes, cold, did he say cold? Hot. <laughs> of course, we wanted hot, of course, we ever heard of co- offering us cold tea? Huh? We weren't wanted, <laughs> you know. <laughs> This, this, uh, uh, and this is very interesting when you come to like food in general the way you know one eats over in the continent the way one eats here is quite different you know in Ireland we tend to cremate meat if it's not black and crunchy it's not cooked it could kill you right so the first time I remember I had a steak that was actually kind of pink and bloody inside and they were the people I was with were convinced this is the way you do it and I went okay wow oh I like this this actually tastes like meat I'm used to it tasting like coal you know it's it's not supposed to break in your mouth. This <laughs> lovely. So it's just to, to, see, to see that oh, things can be done a different way. Things can be done a better way. Things can be done, even though we're used to doing things in a certain way forever, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way of doing it. And sometimes we need a kind of a, a shift of paradigm, a shift of, uh, of perspective, or maybe someone coming in from the outside to say, lads, is this, are we really on the right track here? And this is what the, the, the prophets would often do. They would come in and they, they, would, they would shake things up. People were used to doing things in a certain way. Then the prophet would say, well, is this, is this truly glorifying God? Well, yeah, that's what we thought we've always done. Yeah, but that's not what I asked. <laughs> is, is this glorifying God? But our forefathers did this and our fathers did this and we have been, this is how we have learned. Yes, but that's not, is this glorifying God? And it's, it's, just a, it's a really blunt and relatively simple question. The way we pray, the way you pray, does it glorify God? Because maybe we've just been used to praying a certain way for, forever, and, and this, this can happen to any of us at any stage in our lives. You know, and it's often, it's often terrible when we have a, a kind of a, in German they call it an aha erlebnis, a little, a little aha moment where um, the, kind of the light goes on and you suddenly realize, ooh, I've been ripping through the rosary. I've already just been kind of, I've been so passive at Mass, I've just been kind of sitting there letting Mass happen around me. Kind of oblivious. It doesn't, tends not to happen to me. <laughs> but, but, uh, but it can happen. That you, you kind of become, you become very, very passive at Mass. Just kind of sit there and let it all kind of happen. And then it's over. And you leave. And, and that's, I would, I would actually argue that's quite common for us to be really spectators at Mass and just, just all happens up there and just kind of watch and listen and People move stuff and the choir sing. And, and it's just, it's not an internal reality at all when it should be the greatest internal reality this side of heaven. You know, so, so just because we've done things in a certain way and we're used to doing things, things in that way doesn't mean that's the best way. And at times, as I say, these prophets, whoever they may be, Old Testament prophets, but we also have the people who work in our lives today, people who are an, an example for us today, the people who call us on to more today. And it might be one of them, maybe just by their example, not even by saying anything. You just see the way they pray or they need or they receive Holy Communion. You go, my goodness, I can do better. Like, this isn't, this isn't enough. The way I'm living my faith, it's just, this isn't enough. There's more. There's, there's more. And what's amazing about the discovering of more is that it becomes even more life-giving and even more freeing. So it's not, if I raise the bar, it's going to take more time and it's going to be, I'm going to be more kind of enslaved to this thing. And it's just going to kind of weigh me down even more. So if I pray more, then it's just going to make prayer harder because then I'm going to feel guiltier if I don't do it. You know, and there's this danger almost that if I make any spiritual progress, it's going to make life harder or worse or less free. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Because it does to me. This is like, this is, I, this is maybe, this, maybe, this, this, maybe this is the way I'm tempted. But like th- that voice would come in my head. Yeah, if you up your game in prayer... It's going to take you more time, and you don't have more time. So stay where you are. <laughs> just typically diabolical, like, just typically diabolical. Do you know, if you raise the bar, then, then maybe certain things in your life are going to have to change. And Do you really need to change? Because you're still better than most people out there. Like, 
just see him. You know, so you're still better than them. So maybe that's maybe that's good enough. Is that good enough? It's so typical, like of the enemy, just to kind of yeah, pull you back and just keep you where you are, or slightly less, where you are, or slightly less, but never progressing, never deepening in in, in your, your relationship with the Lord. So at times, like I say, these the, the prophets came in, and they did. They came in with fervor, uh, especially Elijah. He wasn't um, a timid little bukaline at all. Now, he um, he 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 swung and. Uh, we won't go into some of the details of some of the things he did, but like you know, there was the the, the, the showdown uh, between so Ahab, Jezebel, and all the, the priests of Baal, and Elijah. And Elijah was one of the few, if not the only, if you will, orthodox <coughs> prophet left, who said this worship of Baal is not from God. This is not the God of Israel. This is not our God. This is idolatry. The king said, yeah, but it's, it works, though. Look, I mean, everyone's happy. They're doing their prayer thing. Everyone is, it's, all, it's spiritual, isn't it? It's, it's a spirituality. So we're all good, right? But said, no, this is not the God of Israel. It's not, it's not, it's nothing to do with the God of Israel. And so, to prove that this God of Baal, this, that, that God, this God that ye call Baal, is not God, actually a demon, um, We'll, we'll test him. So I want you to build two altars. And we'll put, the, the, we'll put all the fuel on them, so all the timber, all the wood, all the kindling, absolutely. Then the two sacrifices on the altars, all good. And then we'll ask, we'll pray to each god and see which one lights the fire. Straightforward enough. And so they build the two altars. And then the priests of Baal come out and they start dancing and they did a kind of it seems this kind of Elijah talks about it like they did this kind of hobbling hobbling dance he calls it uh, so I don't know maybe I just have this, these images of as the, as, the, as a kind of, kind of as a kind of as a kind of trotting trotting around the fire and then they used to flagell scourge themselves like just right so and then Elijah says to them uh, call a little louder maybe, maybe, maybe he can't hear ye which is it's biblical humor, it's Old Testament biblical humor, um, and uh, obviously you know nothing nothing happens. Then he says, "Okay, my altar there, soak it with water." So obviously everyone is, yeah, sure, absolutely, no problem. Three times they soak it with water, so much so there's a trough of water all around the altar. Like this thing is sopping wet, even even if you could kind of slyly kind of throw in a cigarette butt or a bit of a fire lighter somewhere. There's no way it's going. It's sopping wet like. It doesn't stand a chance. And so Elijah then prays. And he says, God of God, Yahweh, you are our God. You take care of us. Show your power. Lightning falls. Boom. Altar up on flames. The whole thing's sacrificed. After which Elijah takes a sword and kills all the priests of Baal, just so you know. But we're not saying that's what we should do, but like that's what he did. So I'm saying he's not a harmless kind of a fella. You know what I mean? But like, uh, so, it's in the Bible. Um, so, so the point I'm trying to make is that at times like, and, see, when you, and actually even if we do look at that particular event of him removing the priests of Baal from active service, um, <laughs> Even if you, if you do look at that detail, right? And, at times we, and you do, because like it's in the Bible. That's, that, that's not a teaching of something that we should do. You know, so we should go out and slaughter all those who, yeah. Absolutely not. But it is a kind of a, it's one of those historical things that we, we understand spiritually. At times you have to do bloody war in your own life with anything that's taking you away from God. At times you have to just, just de de declare the ban, as they say. You know, kill every living being of that temptation, whatever it may be, whatever draws you into that temptation, or into that place or that person or whatever that thing is, at times you actually have to take out a double-edged sword and just start swinging interiorly, 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 and, and do, do battle with it. If it means the salvation of your soul, if it means the preserva preservation of your faith, then do it and stop just feeling sorry for yourself, moaning around the place, hoping someone else is going to fix it for you. Sometimes you just have to just declare war on it and just go for it. And... You know, so we, we, learn, we learn so much from, from, from the prophets that at times there, there is a better way of doing things. And just because we've been doing things in a certain way doesn't mean they always have to be done that way. At times 
we can get kind of complacent. And, and it happens. It ha I think it happens probably all of us. I would imagine it happens all of us. Because we, we pray in a certain way and it just becomes very familiar. So that's what you do when you go into the chapel or when you go into Mass. And we kind of forget that this is supposed to be a, a, a journey. So we're supposed to be continuously, continuously moving. Now there may be periods where it's a struggle just to stay where you are, okay? Well then struggle to stay where you are. But then when the other seasons come, move, move forward, move forward, move up. Keep ascending, don't just say I'm, I, I'm better than the majority or I'm better than I used to be or anything like that. When we get to heaven, we will not regret a single sacrifice we made in order to become the saints that God is calling us to be. When we get to heaven, we will not regret a single sacrifice. In fact, they'll, they'll look minuscule. We will not regret a single sacrifice that we made in order to become the saints that God is calling us to be. So, today, let us open our eyes to the magnificence of this Eucharist, the celebration of Mass. And tomorrow, is, as it's Sunday, maybe there are people watching on the live stream today who tomorrow will be going to Mass, that we open our eyes to see what God is truly revealing, what he's truly doing, what he's truly saying, what he truly wishes to actually offer us, to give us, to bring us into in this sacrifice of the Holy Mass. And indeed, in every prayer experience, that the Lord might, might draw us ever, ever closer to his heart. And just because we've been praying in a certain way for eons doesn't mean we can't do it better now. So we ask the Lord, in all humility, to guide us. And on this Saturday, we ask our Blessed Lady to teach us to pray, teach us to be humble, prayerful, serving disciples who are not afraid to do battle interiorly with the forces of evil. Amen.